Atlanta leaders applauding their response to a hijacked bus in the metro. How the miles long chase through three counties finally came to an end. And the man Atlanta police say hijacked that bus you just heard about yesterday afternoon was also here at the scene of a shooting that was unrelated right outside inside the food court. I ended up speaking with him as I was looking for witnesses what he said right before he boarded the bus. New information about the accused shooter and what police said went on inside this food court in downtown Atlanta. In another day, another red alert to kickstart your afternoon ride. This one impacting four major interstates. 11 Alive News at 4 p.m. starts now. And first tonight, we are learning more about the moments leading up to two unrelated acts of violence, the shooting of three people at a downtown food court and the deadly hijacking of a Gwinnett County transit bus. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Martin. And I'm Angelina Salcedo in for Faith Jesse. Hours ago, we confirmed one of the people we randomly interviewed moments after the downtown shooting Tuesday is the suspect in the deadly bus hijacking. Now tonight we have team coverage to begin with the latest on the hijacking. 11 Alive's Grace King details how those events unfolded. This section of Hugh Howell Road in Stone Mountain is where the miles long chase through Fulton, DeKalb and Gwinnett counties finally came to an end. I spoke with Atlanta leaders this morning about how it all unfolded. There's not always a game plan for what life gives us. Atlanta Police Chief Darren Sheerbaum speaking to the difficulty of a hijacked bus. Sometimes these men and women have to make it up right then on the fly to save lives. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation says Joseph Greer boarded a Gwinnett County Transit bus in downtown Atlanta and started arguing with an armed passenger. The hijacker disarmed a citizen and then used that weapon to injure a passenger and then used that weapon to forced the driver to do what we saw him do. The chaotic ride lasted for miles, defying stop sticks and striking cars as it drove through traffic on the wrong side of the street. You have an individual saying, if you stop this bus, I'm going to kill the driver, which then means that the whole bus could overturn, could run in, over a ditch or run over a bridge and everyone could die. Even with flattened tires, the bus continued on. The GBI says it took a Georgia State Patrol trooper firing his rifle into the engine compartment of the bus for it to malfunction and finally stop running. This is a bus. Buses are designed to go far. This bus could end up in another state to, to not have it be 17 um, individuals or 16 individuals. Um, you know, thank God for that and thank proper training and, and coordination of all the, uh, you know, the law enforcement agents across the across the region. And this afternoon, authorities identified the passenger shot and killed by Greer as 58 year old Ernest Bird Jr. In Stone Mountain, Grace King, 11 Alive News. And a short time before Joseph Greer got on that bus, by coincidence, 11 Alive interviewed him because he happened to be a witness to the shooting at the Peachtree Center Mall downtown. 11 Alive's Molly Yoke actually talked to him. And Molly, if you can, walk us through how you met him and what exactly he told you. Hey, Jonathan, I was here on scene within an hour of that shooting happening, and between live shots, I was just looking for witnesses to talk to to try to get some kind of information as we were waiting for updates from police. That's when I came right here where I'm standing and met a man named Joseph Greer. He told me he was inside when it happened. He thought he saw the shooter, so I asked if I could interview him. This is our interview you're seeing on the screen now. To be clear, police say that shooting I was interviewing him about happened at Peachtree Center Mall for Food Court around 2.15 yesterday afternoon. Then we interviewed him around 3.45 for only about four minutes. At 4.20, the GBI says this man boarded a Gwinnett County Transit bus and got into a fight with a passenger and took a gun from that passenger, which then led to a shooting and hijacking. Greer is accused of both hijacking the bus and shooting a passenger. That passenger later died. This is a clip from when I talked with him before he got on that bus. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm bipolar, let me tell you all that. I'm off of medication for like two weeks, but Grady gonna give it to me. Um, so I'm leaving out of the thing. So I see the uh, the shooter, you know what I'm saying? I guess the shooter, like, to me, because I'm 6'5", 285. So uh, this is the first guy on the scene right here with the curly hair, with the waves. He the one stopped me from beating. 
Greer also told me when he saw that shooter, he grabbed the woman he was with and hid behind a corner. Greer also told me that he was not allowed to have a gun because he had been convicted of multiple felonies. We're looking more into his criminal history coming up tonight at 5. Guys. All right, unbelievable. Molly, thanks so much. Tonight we are also learning more about what played out during that shooting inside the popular food court in downtown Atlanta. Three people were shot in yesterday's shooting as well as the accused shooter who was shot by an off-duty officer. Atlanta's mayor and police chief speaking with us just hours ago about what they saw on surveillance video that they obtained and what they know about the shooter. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter joins us now from the location where those victims were injured. And Brittany, what can you tell us about how they're doing tonight? Good afternoon to you both. So just hours ago, Atlanta Police Chief Darren Sheerbaum did share with us that the three victims are doing OK and expected to make a full recovery. Thankfully, he did also paint more of a picture of what actually unfolded inside this food court yesterday afternoon. He said after reviewing surveillance video, they combed through it and it appeared the suspected shooter Jeremy Malone had just a brief brush up with another person, which led to some kind of altercation, and that's when he pulled out a gun shooting that person. The other two victims that were shot were apparently a pair of elderly sisters. And we saw different responses, quickly shuttering businesses, sheltering patrons in their establishments, quickly moving to places of shelter, getting out of the area. We also saw some people freeze, froze, didn't move, and could have easily have been victim number four. And less than 24 hours later, police were back out here right across the street from where we're standing. They were at the federal building for an alleged bomb threat and people obviously still trying to process yesterday's events. Fortunately, nothing was discovered, but we'll bring you more from that coming up in about an hour. Reporting from downtown Atlanta, Brittany Kleinpeter, 11 Alive News. Looking for that update, Brittany. Thank you. Trust 11 Alive to bring you updates on air and in our 11 Alive app to both of these stories. It is free to download in your app store. All right, time now for a check of weather and traffic and hopefully a calmer day today. Traffic wise, Crash, you were covering that bus chase minute by minute. Yeah, that was uh, the, just heart pounding. I mean, even when we were wrapping things up and trying to get all the details for that, my heart was still going 100 miles an hour, but great job by the entire 11 Live News team to get all that information yeah. out. Unfortunately, we are starting with a red alert. Oh, okay, we'll get to you in a minute, but the heat is also sort of a red alert for us. It really is, and it's going to become more dangerous, okay? So right now, it's hot outside, but as we get into Friday and the weekend, this is our first serious heat wave of the season so far. Let me show you a big picture of the setup. It's this big heat dome, heat ridge, which has been over the southwest and that's going to expand in our direction by this weekend. So that's going to send temperatures up above average in some cases by about 10 degrees, which this time of year, that's when you know we're pushing close to record territory outside right now. We've got kind of that hazy filtered sunshine, partly sunny in Atlanta, 87 degrees. Humidity's up a little from yesterday, still not bad, but that also will be climbing up a bit as we get into the end of the week, making it feel a couple degrees hotter than the actual temperatures are outside. 86 Duluth, 90 in Peachtree City, 88 in Covington right now, 83 in Canton. So this evening, clouds stick with us. We are warm outside. We're going to be staying mild through the overnight, but as we get into tomorrow, that's when I expect a lot more of us popping around 90 degrees. And then by Friday and the weekend, it's those real extreme days. Uh, so this evening, falling back to the 80s tomorrow, in addition to it being again hot outside, we've got another code orange air quality alert. And this means that the ozone, the particulate matter builds up in the afternoons, unhealthy for sensitive groups. So if you have respiratory illnesses, emphysema, asthma, those who want to really um, limit how much time that you're spending outdoors. The heat becomes dangerous for everybody Friday and this weekend. Crash will break that down for you coming up in just a bit. All right, here we go. Unfortunately, another day, another red alert. Now, the camera was kind of pointing right at what I wanted to show you, but unfortunately, a member of GDOT decided to move that, and that's not good. you got to look to the right of your screen there. You can see all lanes are now being held on I-20. This is heading outbound, leaving downtown I-20 westbound at Windsor Street. As they're holding all lanes to get this tractor trailer out of the roadway here, it is having a major impact. The connector southbound on the East Expressway and and on the connector heading northbound. Folks, the best way we can get you around this thing is MLK Junior Drive, but unfortunately, that is going to be slammed. And you can see right there the connector in both directions. Condition red with a major red alert. I-20, there it is, shut down westbound at Windsor Street.
Back over to you guys. Crash, thank you. We are also following breaking news in Douglas County where crews are working to put out a fire, 11 Alive Sky Tracker, over the apartment complex on Chicago Avenue. Now you can see plumes of smoke billowing into the air there. Fire officials are asking people to expect delays in the area and, of course, avoid it if you can. The cause of the fire still under investigation. We're working to learn some more details. We'll, of course, bring them to you as soon as we get them. Also right now, the all clear has been given after more tense moments in downtown Atlanta. This because of a bomb threat. Law enforcement responding to an address on Peachtree Street Northwest. Several businesses are located in the area, including the Urban League of Greater Atlanta and local offices for the U.S. State Department. Authorities did have to evacuate the building so they could conduct the sweep, which included explosives, uh, the explosives unit and canine officers. No threats or hazards were found and the building was reopened to the public. Look. All new at four, the wreckage of a private plane carrying five men from Georgia and disappeared in Vermont in 1971 may have been found. This is the image on your screen showing what's thought to be the wreckage of the long lost jet at the bottom of the Vermont's Lake Champlain. Now, the flight from Burlington to Providence, Rhode Island, took off during a snowstorm in 1971. All five people on board died after it crashed after taking off. Now, search efforts for the private jet had continued throughout the years. The undersea search specialist who made the discovery says it could be easy to overlook the wreckage. A jet, it looks like a pile of rocks, literally. Uh, so to most people looking at sonar data, they can overlook it because they'll go, oh, that looks like geology. Now the relatives of the victims plan to hold a memorial now that they know where the plane is located. Well, coming up, Oprah Winfrey on the men tonight after a recent trip to the emergency room. And all lanes remain blocked on I-20 westbound, leaving downtown at Windsor Street, and it is having a major impact on that downtown drive. 11 Live News at 4, coming right back. Welcome back to 11 Alive News at 4. The U.S. has remained close to Ukraine in the nation's war against Russia. Now that bond between the countries is about to get a little bit stronger. Ron Jones in with more on what's the expected agreement there. Yeah, that's right. Expected to be much stronger here, Angelina. This is expected to be a bilateral security pact to be signed tomorrow during the G7 summit in Italy. So the U.S. is now set to commit to a 10-year plan to keep training Ukraine's armed forces. This agreement would also boost cooperation and production of weapons and military gear, providing ongoing military assistance and improve intelligence sharing. Sources say that this will be an executive agreement, which means it's a lot less formal than a treaty and may not be binding for future presidents. Today marks eight years since a tragic event at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. A gunman walked in and opened fire, taking the lives of 49 people during the Latin night at the popular gay club. Now, the attack remains one of the deadliest on the LGBTQ plus community and one of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history. Every single year, Orlando honors the victims, their families, their survivors, and the first responders with a special event. The ceremony starts with the ringing of 49 bells, each representing a life lost. The city is also hosting a Remembrance Day blood drive to honor those affected. Well, the sports world is now mourning tonight, folks. Jerry West, one of the all-time basketball legends, has passed away. He was also known as Mr. Clutch and an inspiration behind the NBA logo. West started his career with the Lakers in the 1960s in Minneapolis, shortly before the team relocated to Los Angeles. West was an NBA All-Star each of his 40, 14 seasons in the league, leading the franchise to nine NBA Finals. He went on to coach the team for, four, three, for three seasons. He then served in several front office roles for the Lakers, uh, the Grizzlies, the Warriors, and the Clippers. West passed away this morning with his wife Karen by his side. He was 86 years old. 416, your time right now. We've been watching this heat building to our west, and that heat ridge is going to be expanding in our direction over the weekend. What this does is it traps in that heat for us. It gives us a series of really hot days in a row, and this will be our first serious heat streak of the year. Okay, so we're not used to this kind of heat like we would be by late July or August time frame. Here are the three peak days for us. Friday forecasting a high of 95. It's going to feel like it's about 97 on Friday afternoon. Saturday forecasting 90. 
97 for that high temperature, feeling like it's close to 100 degrees. And then by Sunday, we'll see temperature around 95 for Father's Day, humidity up a little bit. So that's going to push that feels like temperature up by about three degrees up to 98 by Sunday afternoon. So think about this in the back of your mind as you're trying to make Father's Day weekend plans. If you have outdoor plans, can you limit how long you're outdoors? Can you make sure those outdoor plans are first thing in the morning or in the evening? You really want to limit overexerting your body, exercising in the middle of that high heat. And also remembering if you're going to be outside, wear light colored clothing. Stay hydrated and listen to your body. If you're noticing that you're really starting to feel faint, lightheaded, move indoors, stay hydrated go into the AC and cool your body back down. So take the heat very seriously here as we head throughout the next couple of days. Uh, we've got temperatures that are outside right now in the 80s. We do have a code orange air quality alert right now, and we will again see another code orange air quality alert for the day tomorrow. So this is on top of the heat that's out there. We're going to see humidity levels uh, in that particulate matter building up in the atmosphere that is going to certainly give us that code orange air quality for tomorrow. 87 is where we stand right now in Atlanta. Peachtree City is 90 degrees. Covington's 88. It's 84 in Carrollton. 87 right now in Rome. And this evening, we'll see those temperatures falling back from the upper 80s into the low 80s. And tomorrow morning, we are going to start mild and muggy outside. Let me show you the forecast track hour by hour. A little bit of cloud cover first thing in the morning, giving way to more sunshine for the afternoon tomorrow. That'll bump us up to the low 90s for temperatures. And as we get into Friday time frame, that's when that really extreme heat starts to build in. Friday morning around 70 for that high. We're already around 90 by noon. And then by Friday afternoon, mid 90s, we've got brave I believe coming back in town. So it is going to be a hot streak heading through your Father's Day weekend. Overnight temperatures tonight, we're dropping down to the upper 60s. And then for tomorrow, we'll see temperatures that'll be climbing up with highs around the low 90s in the afternoon tomorrow. So very hot, a little bit more humid than today, not quite to those records. As we get into Friday, Saturday and Sunday at those points we're only a couple of degrees from our record highs and again it is going to feel closer to 100 degrees as we get into Saturday and Sunday. We are bringing in for your Father's Day itself a little bit more cloud cover stray shower possible. Then we'll finally see that really hot weather breaking a bit by early next week. Highs will stay around 90 with an isolated shower storm possible on Monday. Crash. All right, Melissa, appreciate that. The red alert's going to continue here, folks, trying to get out of downtown on the West Expressway. At one point, they had all lanes blocked. Looks like they've got a right lane, a couple of right lanes open now, but that's a jackknife tractor trailer that's been blocking all these lanes for well over an hour now. An I-20 westbound heading outbound right at Windsor Street, so it's impacting the the connector southbound as folks try to make that transition, the connector northbound, and look what it's doing to the East Expressway, backing you up towards Moreland Avenue. Everybody trying to get out west. It's a rough way to get out of downtown. MLK Junior Drive is your best bet, but I promise you that's going to be a packed house. And like I said, look at the impact. Those cars coming at you. That's the connector southbound, bumper to bumper, trying to make that transition to I-20 and head out west. Angelina? Crash, thank you. Coming up, one member of the Jonas Brothers announces that he he has cancer, the message he now has for his fans next. Plus, going out for a meal is getting more and more costly. We'll tell you where more of us are turning to when we go dine out. And as we head to break, a Voices for Equality Fastback for you. Among other things, June is Caribbean American Heritage Month. Today, we're asking you, which U.S. president named June National Caribbean American Heritage Month in 2006? The answer, right after this. All right, now the question that we gave you before the break, the, this U.S. president named June National Caribbean American Heritage Month in 2006. The answer, President George W. Bush. Well, tonight, Oprah Winfrey is recovering after a stomach virus recently sent her to the emergency room. In a video call posted to Instagram, Oprah told her best friend, Gail King, that she couldn't keep enough water down to keep hydrated, which made her seek treatment. King observed her friend seeming weakish in the video, and Oprah agreed that she is not feeling 100% yet, but she says, I'm on my way. Winfrey noted that multiple people in her household also caught the bug and warned viewers to remember to wash your hands. K-pop star Jin has completed his mandatory military, military service in South Korea after spending 18 months on duty. Military service, you may know, is required by law for men in South Korea. Now, Jin is the first member of the K-pop group to 
complete his military duties. The group is expected to fully reunite in 2025 when all seven members have been discharged. Kevin Jonas is sending out a piece of advice to all of his fans. Get your moles checked. The Jonas Brothers singer revealed he has basal cell carcin carcinoma removed from his head, and he showed off the gauze uh, covering his fresh scar right on social media here. The 36-year-old camp rock star asked his fans to make sure they monitor their skin. The Skin Cancer Foundation commended Jonas for raising awareness about this disease. The Jonas Brothers are currently on a break from their world tour. We're wishing him well, but mm -hmm. great that he is going to be able to spread the message to so many people with the platform that he has. Absolutely, and as a guy from Miami, Florida, who used Used to unfortunately lay out with straight yeah. baby oil back in the 80s. I had one of those particular things removed really? from mm. my chest, so it's no joke. Get checked. That and remember your sunscreen always. Absolutely. Yeah. Always. always, especially now when it's going to be so hot. All right. Yeah. We got a red alert, unfortunately, big time, and it's impacting multiple interstates. And here's where we are right here. This jackknife tractor trailer on I-20 heading westbound at Windsor Street. And believe me, it's impacting everyone trying to do that downtown drive. Melissa? And crash, we're looking at that heat cranking up as well. Dangerous numbers coming in Friday and into the weekend. We'll talk about that next at 430. Right now, the jury is deliberating in the trial of Miles Bryant, the former Doraville police officer charged with murder in the death of 16-year-old Susanna Morales. I'll break down the closing arguments straight ahead. And the heat builds. We're talking about temperatures not far from records. We'll talk about which days will feel the hottest. Also, the nation's attorney general targeted for being held in contempt by Congress coming up when the House is expected to vote. Also coming up, could potentially toxic materials be found in your next glass of milk? We're investigating the potential risks to your health. Welcome back to 11 Alive News at 4. Right now, we are on verdict watch. A Gwinnett County jury is debating the fate of a former Doraville police officer, Miles Bryant. And Bryant, you may know, is facing five charges, including felony murder and kidnapping in connection with the death of 16-year-old Susana Morales in July of 2022. 11 Alive's Karis Belzer joining us live again tonight. Karis, you've been following this case from the very start. So what happened today? Well, actually, just a few minutes ago, the jury sent a note to the judge asking for clarification on the meaning of malice. This is in connection with the malice murder charge, one of five that Bryant is facing. The day began with closing arguments, and the defense attorney, Tracy Drake, began. At first, Bryant's attorney argued the evidence in this case was circumstantial, and she expected for the charge of filing a false report. The case was circumstantial, except for the charge of filing a false report for the missing firearm. Bryant reported the gun was stolen, and that gun was later found in the same wooded area as Susana Morales' remains. Drake argued it was impossible to prove that her client killed Susana Morales because there's no official cause of death and no clear proof her client deliberately intended to take her life. The prosecution argued differently, that it was clear what Bryant did and what he is accused of, and also what his intentions were. At one point, he said, quote, we don't have to go hunting for Bigfoot in the woods here. It's obvious what happened to Susana Morales. Plus, she's walking home after smoking pot. Maybe something else. We don't know. I'll get to that in just a little bit. Is it unreasonable to think that he stops and says, hey, I got some edibles. Let's go smoke some more and her get in the car. I'm asking you to do your job. Asking you to look at the evidence, to use your common sense, and to see through the manipulations and the lies and the red herrings and all of the other distractions that they're trying to throw at you and look at the case and hold him guilty for the death of Susan Morales. Again, the jury is deliberating as we speak. I will continue to keep you updated as soon as we have an update. All right, Karis Belger, Live Force, thanks so much. All right, have you been outside today? It is hot. It is very <laughs> hot out there. You can certainly feel a difference. Yes, uh, we want to get a quick check of the forecast because these 
hot temperatures are probably going to continue, huh, Melissa? They're going to get even worse, guys. We're right around 90 for high temperatures today and tomorrow, but that heat really gets a lot more extreme as we get into Friday and the weekend. And this is the first kind of heat wave of the season, so it's a little bit more shock to the system than if we were talking about these numbers in, say, late July or early August. So hot weather, that's going to be the weather story here the next couple days. I just want to give you a snapshot of what's to come. Friday 95, Saturday 97, Sunday for Father's Day 95. And you notice those numbers in the darker red. Those are our feels like temperatures each of those afternoons. So over the weekend, as you're trying to make those Father's Day plans, it's going to feel like it's around 100 each afternoon. Also, those overnights, not very cool. Not a lot of act, uh, time for your body to cool down if you don't have good AC working. Outside right now, it is partly sunny. It's warm outside, but nowhere near as hot as where we're going. 87 in Atlanta right now. Humidity up a little bit from yesterday. Still not bad. Across the metro, copper spots are right around 90. This evening, we'll keep the clouds around. Temperatures staying in the 80s all the way up through sunset. Tomorrow, the heat gets a little bit hotter than today. Crash will break that down for you coming up a little bit later. All right, Melissa, I watched the heavy-duty wrecker pull up more than a half hour ago, but they are still trying to get this tractor trailer cab out of the way. It takes a while to move these things because they are heavy and they don't want to go anywhere, especially when they jackknife and we can see one, two, three lanes are blocked. 433 in the afternoon. Not a good place to put it on I-20 heading outbound right at Windsor Street. That's trying to get out of downtown and look what it's doing. Look at the East Expressway. Folks trying to come in back as far as Moreland and Glenwood. It's jamming you through East Atlanta. You may want to try Memorial. Connector southbound is jammed up as folks want to try to head out west and even the connector northbound feeling the impact of this one problem. MLK Junior Drive is your best bet out of town, but no, that's going to be packed. It is a, it's not looking good downtown right now, Jonathan. All right, Crash, keep us posted. A live look right now outside the world's busiest airport where they will be celebrating National Men's Health Month and Father's Day weekend with a health and wellness seminar tomorrow. This is for men employed by Hartsville Jackson. The event will take place at the airport's North Cargo facility. There will be free health screenings and motivational speakers and healthy cooking demonstrations. By the way, this is the second year that they've had this event there at the airport. A morning of service for two local groups, volunteers from Hope Atlanta and Georgia's Own Credit. They kicked off summer by serving lunches for women and children. This is being done to fight childhood hunger as children are, as schools rather, are closing for the summer and many kids are going without meals. This morning, volunteers made snack packs complete with non-perishable foods like cereal bars and fruit squeezes. Organizers say this work is so critical as many families are experiencing stress due to limited access to food resources. The summer is so often associated with fun and relaxation, um, but for a lot of families, the reality is, is summer is a stressful time. So we're partnering with Hope to try to bridge that gap and to provide them with meals um, where they wouldn't otherwise have access to it. So this summer, Hope Atlanta is set to serve 3,600 hot meals and distribute 3,000 snack packs to families in need. Speaking about food, dining out could be eating up your budget. That's because the cost of going out to eat keeps on rising. As I'm sure many of us know, inflation data released today shows prices at sit-down restaurants rose almost half percent last month and fast food prices also went up 0.2 percent. But data from the past 12 months paints an even clearer picture. Prices at sit down restaurants rose three and a half percent overall and fast food prices jumped to four and a half. The increases have caused customers to pull back on spending, leaving restaurants scrambling to lure them back with menu bundles and deals. I'm a big fan of those deals too, but yeah. it's been tough. Very, you want to go out so. and eat. Yeah, you look at that bill. You're like, what? Okay. Where's, for what I got, this is what it's costing. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, don't know. I, don't, I don't know. Especially when you got kids mm -hmm. and then yeah. you add in maybe mm -hmm. one drink and plus the tip. It just yeah. I mean, it's not that affordable to go out to eat a once a week. So. Yeah. And we used to make fun of grandmama when she would open up that big bag <laughs> and put rolls in there and butter thin. Yeah, grandma knew what was going on. She knew yeah. what was happening. Get that to go. Yeah, you got to do it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, Pope Francis has as an audience plan for later this week with a group of people that are bound to give him a few laughs. Also still ahead, find out what's behind recent earthquakes being felt near Lake Lanier. And while the rest of the rush hour just slowly does its thing, we are concentrating all our efforts on this jackknife tractor trailer on I-20 westbound, leaving downtown at Windsor Street. Folks, it's just getting worse, unfortunately. 11 Alive News at 4, coming right back.
Earlier today, the House voted on holding Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress. Our Ron Jones is here with more on that ruling. That's right, Jonathan. We are monitoring that as we speak. The House passed this rule today by a narrow 208 to 207, which means the Garland contempt resolution will now be debated and put to a final vote. House Republicans are now moving to hold Garland in contempt for refusing to turn over audio recordings of President Joe Biden's interviews with the former special counsel Robert Herr. Herr investigated Biden's handling of the classified material and declined to bring any charges. We're going to let you know when that final vote after the debate comes down. Former Donald Trump advisor Steve Bannon is now asking a federal appeals court to delay his jail sentence. Bannon is expected to report to prison on July 1st to serve for four months. The sentence comes after he failed to provide documents and testimony to the House Select Committee who were investigating the January 6th U.S. Capitol attack. Now he's asking, Bannon is asking the court to rule on his request by June 18th. And then he plans to go to the Supreme Court if necessary. Hey, later on this week, this is really cool. Pope Francis will be hosting an audience with a rather comical group of people. The Vatican announcing the Pope will meet some of the world's top comedians this Friday. So the lineup includes Whoopi Goldberg, Jimmy Fallon, Chris Walk, and Stephen Colbert. Vatican sources say that the Pope recognizes the powerful role comedy plays in making the world a more empathetic and understanding place. The meeting aims to build a connection between the Catholic Church and comedic artists, highlighting the importance of humor and fostering compassion. Did you feel the recent earthquakes up around Lake Lanier? If so, we'll explain what was behind the tremors and how scientists are working to learn more about that. And we're looking at a partly sunny, warm afternoon, but nowhere near as hot as things are going to get for Father's Day weekend. We'll break it down for you day by day in your forecast next. A series of three earthquakes in the last week right near Lake Lanier, and some of, the, some of those quakes shook the ground enough for a lot of neighbors to feel it. But you may be wondering tonight why they happened and could more be coming. Meteorologist Melissa Nord sat down with a geophysicist to get some answers for you. What's usually a quiet, peaceful place on an early summer's evening shook with tremors from the ground. First, a magnitude 2.5 earthquake Thursday at 11.15 p.m. An aftershock, a magnitude 2.1 at 1.30 that night. Then a second aftershock, a 2.3 magnitude earthquake Sunday evening. Although weak, many who live near the epicenters felt these. We received dozens of comments on Facebook and into our newsroom of people feeling their house shake. Dr. Andrew Newman, geophysicist at Georgia Tech, explains there are several reasons why many people may have felt the earthquakes. One certainly is proximity, how close you are. If you're really close to it, obviously you're going to feel it better. Another thing is if the earthquake is really shallow, if it's very near the surface of the earth, we'll feel it much better as well. And this earthquake was quite shallow. And earthquakes are easier to feel here on the East Coast. Seismic waves travel much, uh, much more efficiently. They go further and are larger, so, it's e it's, so you have a larger area where you potentially could shake and uh, people can feel it. Although earthquakes are not uncommon in our state, where these happened were not on any active faults. That same fault system, yeah. at least through Georgia, is right here and we don't really see earthquake activity on it. Scientists from Georgia Tech, the University of Georgia, and Georgia State University are now collaborating to get to the root of the cause. They'll be installing a handful of seismic nodes to be buried in the ground and several surface shake sensors to then catch any future small quakes. Like a stethoscope directly against the chest, being able to hear the heartbeat. Although Dr. Newman says a larger quake is unlikely, if there are more aftershocks, they can get a clearer image of the cause then we can start actually mapping out individual faults that which these earthquakes occur on. So if you felt it, you felt them, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of us didn't, but uh, they want to be able to get a better, clearer picture of what's going on. Is there a fault there that's kind of coming back to life or not? So they're going to start installing those tomorrow and Friday and hopefully get a little more information. Yeah. It's cool how technology has changed so that we can do that. Too. Yeah, it's yeah, good. it's it's a wonderful thing. And the more pieces of data they get, it's a clearer picture. It's like a better pair of glasses they're putting on. All right, from one natural disaster to another, let's take a look at the tropics because we have two areas we're now watching. Yesterday, it was just one at this time. Two areas in the tropics that we're watching, neither of them show 
high chances of development over the next several days, but some shine signs show that by early next week, maybe that little western Bay of Campeche low may start to develop. That's got a 20% chance of development. Another area of broad low pressure over the Florida Peninsula has been bringing just tremendous amounts of rainfall to parts of the peninsula of Florida. We're talking about rainfall totals. Sarasota yesterday was over like eight inches of rain in a small amount of time. Miami is just getting inundated with rainfall right there. But meanwhile, that's where all the tropical moisture is going to stay. And for us, it's all about this dry weather, but heat that's going to be building over the next couple of days and lasting all the way into the weekend. So temperature pattern over the weekend this heat ridge is building. The heat's intensifying and we'll focus Focus on that. We're calling it dangerous heat because number one, this is the first heat wave of the season for us. But number two, you see these numbers, you think, okay, they're not quite to the records. Is this really that unusual for us? You know, when you don't cool down your body enough during this kind of heat, and you can't cool your body down by sweating. If you get overheated too quickly, it can turn into a very dangerous thing in a hurry. So we want you to take this heat seriously here over the next couple of days. Now for tomorrow, we're forecasting highs right around the low 90s again, but those numbers are going to go up and not too far off the records as we get into Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Noticing these highs are going to be up in the mid 90s. It's going to feel like a couple degrees hotter than that. So it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday when I want you to think in the back of your mind, what are my plans? Can I move Move them indoors. If we have outdoor plans in the middle of the afternoon, can you move it to first thing in the morning or later in the evening when the temperatures are not as hot? Those are the types of preparations you need to take now for this kind of heat. In addition, good reminders for the summertime, wear light colored clothing, loose fitting clothing, staying hydrated and listening to your body. If you're outside exercising and you feel like, you know what, I think I'm overdoing it, you're probably overdoing it. So just listen to your body. Code orange air quality alert again for tomorrow so that ozone particulate matter is kind of being trapped in the atmosphere and not allowing to escape. So we'll probably see more of those code orange air quality alerts in the next couple of days here. Right now, temperatures upper uh, 80s, right around 90 degrees, Peachtree City, 91 in LaGrange right now. We have a lot of cloud cover out there right now. We'll keep that around for the evening, but no chance of rain in the forecast. We'll see temperatures falling back through the 80s by sunset and then tomorrow morning. It's a mild start to the day. We'll be starting off upper 60s, low 70s for First thing in the morning, a little bit of cloud cover night thins out for the afternoon tomorrow. Notice those temperatures up around 90 and then by Friday, even more sunshine and hotter. That's when that heat dome goes right overhead. So that'll send our temperatures up to the mid 90s on Friday afternoon. Let me show you your seven day forecast. Notice over the weekend by Sunday, we'll bring back more humidity, which will introduce a 20% chance of a stray shower on your Father's Day afternoon. But again, 97 Saturday, 95 on Sunday. Looks like that extreme heat kind of backs off a little bit as we get into early to middle part of next week. Crash. All right, Melissa, you said my hometown of Miami was saturated, so I had to just take a peek at a Florida DOT camera. Holy smoky potatoes. That's what they're dealing with down in Miami. That is not good. All right, we've got our own problems to deal with, but I give you good news. They have finally got this jackknife tractor trailer off to the side of the road. They are reopening all lanes 20 westbound at Windsor Street, but folks, the damage is done. I-20, the East Expressway backed up towards Moreland Avenue. The connector southbound took a one-two punch. Even the connector northbound is feeling that. Hopefully, we can get some of this moving again. MLK Jr. Drive, still a great alternate if you can get to it depending on where you need to be but some good news there it is all lanes finally back open on i-20 westbound at windsor street angelina good news to see crash thank you well here's what we're working for you at five more developments coming out of the ysl rico trial what we're learning about an appeal from young thug's attorney to end being held in contempt also the reward for a missing hall county girl has been increased we'll share what's being done to try and bring 12 year old maria gomez perez home and our coverage of postal problems continues. We'll explain how widespread mail delays are impacting the state's court system. Those stories and much more all new and next at five. Some new numbers tonight are showing inflation cooled more than expected in May. Consumer prices rose 3.3 percent. This is from a year earlier. That's a slightly slower rate than back in April. The Consumer Price Index report reveals on a month to month basis prices were flat. That was also a slower pace from April's gain of three tenths of a percent. So this is the first time in nearly two years that the CPI did not rise on a monthly basis. OK, so the Apple Watch is getting a new feature that many users have been requesting for years. You'll now be able to 
pause your activity rings, which can be helpful if you're sick or if you're traveling or just can't exercise. You can pause progress for a day uh, by day of the week or for even months at a time. The system will still collect your metrics, but if you fail to reach the number that normally closes your ring, you will not lose your streak. So there you have it. Still ahead, forever chemicals found in milk sitting on store shelves. Coming up, 11 Alive investigates whether the supply is safe. Next on 11 Alive News at 4. All right, welcome back, everyone. The federal government puts limits on what are called forever chemicals in your drinking water. But what about your food? Forever chemicals we know are toxic, but there are still no federal guidelines when it comes to putting them in your food. With new reports of contamination affecting farms especially, our Ron Jones shares what scientists are now saying about whether your family's milk is safe. Add it to your coffee, pour it over your cereal, or just drink a glass of it. Milk is a staple in practically any fridge. So besides essential vitamins and minerals, there might be some things in milk not so good for you. A bunch of dairy farms over the years have reported PFAS contamination in their water or their soil, and then subsequently in their cows and then the milk that the cows produce. PFAS, also known as forever chemicals because they essentially never break down naturally, have been linked to cancer, immunity, and endocrine problems and infertility. PFAS have historically been added to consumer products to make them nonstick, waterproof, stain resistant. And then once PFAS are out in the world, they end up in our water supply, in the fertilizer that farms use, and they end up in our food, and they end up in us. To investigate the potential problem, CR recently conducted a limited test of 50 samples of whole milk purchased from grocery stores in five states. The good news, the investigation found PFOS or PFOA to PFOS, most often linked to harmful health effects in only six of the 50 samples. But there are some red flags to consider. No one should stop drinking milk based on these findings. However, it does show how our federal food safety agencies and manufacturers are not monitoring for PFAS in milk and other foods and the needs for health protective limits for these harmful chemicals. In response to questions from Consumer Reports, the International Dairy Foods Association said dairy foods and beverages are highly regulated and rely on a verified system to ensure their safety and integrity. If you're concerned about PFAS, you can limit your exposure by avoiding stain and water-resistant clothing and carpets and using cookware that claims to be PTFE-free, such as pans with ceramic coatings. Ron Jones, 11 Alive News. Okay, so if you're looking for some other ways to limit your exposure, Experts say to test your drinking water. If there are chemicals present, find a certified water filter, and that way you can remove them. Tonight, we are learning more about that bus chase in Gwinnett County. For the first time, we're hearing from the daughter of the bus driver of that hijacked bus. That's coming up next on 11 Alive News at 5. Plus, postal problems continue out of the USPS Palmetto facility. How delayed mail is causing big trouble for people summoned to jury duty. Next at 5. 